Welcome to another episode of Growth Hacker TV. I'm Bronson Taylor, and today I have Micah Kaufman with us. Micah, thanks for coming on the program. Thanks for having me. Yeah, now you are the founder of Fiverr.com. Uh, I'm sure many people know what Fiverr is. I've used it personally. Um, little side note, I actually used it personally on Growth Hacker TV. I don't know if you're aware of this, but our intro that plays before the videos was a Fiverr gig, and the voiceover on our intro was a Fiverr gig, and I put the two together and have this amazing intro. But anyway, that's a side note. Um, so tell us a little bit about Fiverr. Uh, what is Fiverr.com? Okay, so essentially Fiverr is a uh, marketplace for services, right? It's, uh, it's um, services that are being offered by extremely creative and talented people from all around the world in what we have today is 120 categories ranging from uh, personal services like uh, customized greetings, photo editing, gifts, to the very business essentials. And you've mentioned a few um, that, that you've used, uh, but that's graphic design, uh, software and web development, translation, video editing, voiceovers, advertising, anything. I mean, we think that Fiverr is for services, what eBay is for products, essentially. Gotcha. Yeah. So people go there, they spend five bucks, which is where the name Fiverr comes from. They spend five bucks or so, give or take, and they, uh, and they can get the thing they need, the service they want, right? Right, right. I mean, when, when Fiverr it was really, everything was $5, and that was the base price. Um, at this point, we've already uh, stretched that, and it's, it's services that range between 5 and 500 but uh, we can dive into it later. Yeah, absolutely. Now, what year did uh, Fiverr launch? Um, early 2010. I mean, there's an idea. Um, my uh, co-founder and myself, my co-founder uh, uh, is Shai Winninger, and he's our uh, CTO. It, as an idea, it started from a phone call. Uh, one of many that we used to have at that point, uh, starting with the words, I have an idea. <laughs> the dangerous, the dangerous right. phrase right there. <laughs> right. But, but something about this idea really, really stuck. And, you know, the, the first sign w uh, was really you wake up in the morning and the idea is there. You continue to, to think about it. And then, you know, fr from that point on, you, you kind of dive into doing, you know, looking at the market, figuring out if there is really something substantial behind this idea. But, but, mm -hmm. So we launched, we launched early 2010. Yeah, so walk me through that process a little bit. Um, Why did you feel the need? What was it about this idea that made you keep thinking about it when you woke up? Right. Um, well, so the, the story I think is a little bit philosophical, but but I think is 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 worth uh, is worth mentioning. So basically, uh, both Shai and myself are um, uh, we're not. This is not our first startup, so we're kind of seasoned entrepreneurs, and we've been working quite a lot with uh, with freelancers. Um, and so we we knew what this experience was. One of the things that we realized that was the fact that, you know, we're kind of at a turning point in history. If we look at a day's generation, um, there's two um, uh, very important things that this generation is exposed to. First is that they have unlimited access to information and knowledge. Um, and, and this, you know, gives them the opportunity to actually gain skills at a, at a much younger age. And the second thing is they have unlimited at a click of a mouse, right? People that posted something on YouTube and became famous, uh, social networks, and, and so forth. So, really, you know, the, the internet made this opportunity uh, uh, to, to develop one's skills and also made the economy of, of services really, you know, truly global. So, this brought us to the, to the realization that today everyone has a talent that someone else needs, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So, how cool would that be if you can actually put this enormous bucket of talent and you can actually serve it to people that need this talent? You know, we gave this a name. We call this the gig economy, right? Mm -hmm. And we actually think that this is, you know, this is changing the way people think about work and about their financial independence. Um, and plus, one of the things that we realized that was that this is a multi-billion dollar market opportunity. At, at this point, if you only look at the freelancing uh, market, it's beyond a billion dollars this year. So whenever such an opportunity uh, uh, rises, um, it obviously attracts a lot of uh, potential for amazing companies to start off. And, and we're seeing a lot of them 
doing that. A lot of them are very verticalized, but it also creates the opportunity to actually create a giant company around this market. But in order to do that, um, you actually need to be a market disruptor, right? You need to disrupt this market. And when I was looking at, uh, you know, at history of, of other companies that have been disrupting different markets, um, I've noticed that um, there's, the thing about disruption is that there's a lot of things that are um, in the control or um, uh, reach of the company, the entrepreneurs, things that they can do um, when you look at successful companies, they are all been executing amazingly. There's one thing that is beyond the control of the company and the entrepreneurs, and it's either there or not. For lack of a better name, I call it stars aligning. Mm -hmm. So looking at other markets, um, and e-commerce is, is, is an amazing example, 15 years ago, stars aligned, and this, is, this made Amazon and eBay possible. Right? It doesn't. E-commerce e did start it 16 or 17 years ago, but no giant came out of it because stars weren't aligned. Mm -hmm. So the thing about stars aligning is that every market has its own stars. Right? Um, my analysis was that for the gig economy, the stars are aligning right now. Okay. And without going into too many details, um, you know. You always think. Look, look at look at early 2010 when we launched um, um, around the the entire debate on re-election. It was the unemployment rates, the well-educated but underpaid, mm -hmm. right? The uh, downfall of the stock market and everything. So this, together with technology that was that was becoming, you know, so so commoditized, right? Uh, anything from from you know building a marketplace to taking care of payments and everything. So, so those stars aligned. And, and when we looked at kind of the traditional freelancing models at that time, um, freelancing online started probably, I would say, I don't know, like eight, nine years ago. And, and we all know the, the companies that, that were uh, first to this game. Um, we feel that the traditional freelancing mar marketplaces online are, are really broken. They're broken because because you know they, they they they're outdated because they started a long time ago and things really change and it's it's a new generation mm -hmm. and because they're full of friction. Um, you can try any of those marketplaces. You will immediately sense how hard it is to use them. Everything from onboarding to you know you define a project and then you have people coming and bidding on the cheapest price and then you need to vet on them and, and decide who's going to take the project and then you need to manage them it's a full time job mm -hmm. you know there's a place for that but most things in life most um, sellers and buyers are not you know necessarily professional huge projects there's small things there are medium things that needs to be done right mm -hmm. and for that this is not the system. So the idea was really to, when we launched Fiverr at uh, early 2010, we had this mission of, you know, we're going to fix what was broken. We're going to uh, create a friction-free marketplace where everyone can participate. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. so we had this, this notion of really creating something that is simple, intuitive, and not less important, fun, mm -hmm. right? So we looked at things, and, and this pertains to growth hacking, right? So we looked at things like onboarding, and we said, you know what? If, if setting up an account, listing a service, and, and being up and running to start selling takes more than five minutes, we're doomed. Mm -hmm. It's not going to work, right? If buying takes more than 20 to 30 seconds, it's not going to happen. People think too much, and they walk away, mm -hmm. right? And we even... It looked naive when we actually launched it, but we even used phrases like buy, sell, have fun, where they captured everything right within that. And we had this, this idea of, of really creating this marketplace as, as, a, uh, as a huge community for those what we call new entrepreneurs, which are this new generation. Um, and that everything should be around global share of talent. And this is very important because, you know, um, we believe that the gig economy is, is 
all about global share account. We, we, we work with those who know better and therefore are more efficient, not necessarily with those who are cheaper, mm -hmm. right? You know, we, we so, so we really essentially we create jobs for talented people. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. what happened was that one of the big frictions that we found was price negotiation, right? And so, and so we started with a single price. It was five dollars, so everything was a flat price. And a few people that didn't really see the vision behind it thought, yeah, but five dollars is really not a lot of money, right? It's pretty cheap. But but what everybody you know um, was missing was the fact that when you cannot negotiate the price, you actually compete on quality, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Everybody, you know, cheap labor can compete for cheap prices, mm -hmm. but they cannot compete on quality, right? So all of a sudden, quality was the issue. And so, and so this, this is kind of the, the basic story behind, behind how we yeah. started finding. No, that's great. And you've already given us, I think, two really great insights into growth. One, what you call stars aligning, um, almost seems like it's just a matter of timing. Every industry has the right time to kind of come into its own. And I think about it like surfing, you know? If you're a little bit too early, you don't catch the wave. If you're a little bit too late, you don't catch the wave. Even though you're right there next to it, you have to catch the wave to catch the wave. And then the second insight you gave us was friction. So have the right timing and have low friction, and then you have a chance at growth. Now tell me this, Micah. Um, tell me about how large Fiverr is today. Um, anything you can disclose, you know, the size of the site, visitors, transactions, gigs, anything you can let us know. Okay. So, um, so Fiverr has been growing pretty aggressively uh, year over year. Um, at this point, we have about uh, 1.6 million active buyers and sellers and many more millions visiting the site every month. Um, we serve customers from 200 countries. Um, we're listing close to 2 million gigs or services, we call them gigs, wow. and we're growing by, let's say, about 4,000 new listings per day. Um, we offer services in 120 categories. Mm -hmm. um, what, one of the things that we're uh, most proud about is, and, and this again takes me back to a to a conversation that that I had with with Shai when we were starting. I, I told him, you know, um, if if we were to succeed, the only way that we can do that is if we can actually create jobs for Americans, mm -hmm. for Western countries, right? It shouldn't be around you know third world countries serving the more wealthy countries. That's fine as well, but it needs to be plain level. It needs to be accessible for everyone. It shouldn't be about, about who's the cheapest. It should be about who's the best, who's the right person for the job. And I think we're probably the only global marketplace for services online today that can say that. We have 65% of our sellers coming from the U.S., UK, Canada, and Australia, 65%. So, so the majority are actually Americans and, and Westerns. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of, in terms of um, um, size of the transactions, I mean, uh, a gig is being sold every six seconds. Mm -hmm. so this gives you, gives you a sense of size, and it ranges between, the prices of a single gig ranges between five and 500. Yeah. Those are great numbers, and you know that's what we aspire to is to have startups that grow that way. Um, so take us back to the beginning a little bit, and let's see how you got there, because that's what this audience wants to know, is now you're there, but how'd you get there? So after launch, how did you all get the first set of people on both sides of the marketplace? And anything you can tell us specifically would be great, because it's hard to start from nothing. You have no buyers, you have no sellers. What do you do to get any buyers and any sellers? Right. So. I think that again, this this goes back to um, to a little bit of, uh, of of our approach to to the vision. Um, I mean, any startup may, may have a huge, you know, a big vision, but but each big vision needs to start somewhere, right? Mm -hmm. And I think you know, I think that we as 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 uh, as entrepreneurs, as CEOs, as, as startups. What we essentially do is we are storytellers, right? We tell a story. We have a narrative. 
that a story that unfolds. And so take, for example, the story of fire, right? We sat down and said, okay, we're going to build the next eBay for services or the next Amazon for services. That's huge. Okay, so this is how the story ends. But how, how does it start? So this taking, you know, taking the narrative, taking the story, and decomposing it, and actually telling it backwards, right? And, and, and converging and taking, you know, we call this the art of reduction, right? Mm -hmm. Reducing things from the complex. Think about eBay, right? Think about eBay 15 years ago. What would have happened if they launched the way they look today 15 years ago? Nobody would have get it. It's too darn complicated. Mm -hmm. It's too feature rich. It's great for now, but it wouldn't have, you know, stuck mm -hmm. in, in people's minds. And so this uh, process of reduction is, is really all about focusing on the very, very simple value proposition that you, that you actually offer, right? Mm -hmm. What is the bare minimum? The, the single thing that actually creates value for your audience, um, and and focus on that. So it's it's a very simple but meaningful value, mm -hmm. and a single call for action. Right? What do you want to do first? So I would say you know, I would say that uh, that in any marketplace. Maybe with the exception of commodity, mm -hmm. marketplaces start with supply. They always start with supply. They never start with demand. And you can you, you can check that. <laughs> and if you can find, yeah, I, I trust you. I <laughs> if trust you can find you. another uh, example, that that would be great because I couldn't. Uh -huh. So so for us, we thought, okay, so we needed to build a supply. So we needed a single call for action. And what is the call for action? Become a seller. How do you lure? someone to become a seller. So we had this very uh, noticeable tiny form on the homepage, starting with the words, I will blank for $5, submit. That was it, mm -hmm. right? Fill in the blank and you're up and running. Mm -hmm. it, was, it was so simple, it was so tempting that you would feel stupid not to try it, right? <laughs> it's, it's, it's out there. So, so really, Creating this very, very um, definable, uh, um, uh, focused uh, value proposition, single call for action, and then you know you you can do the obvious things like uh, you know what we call hamster strategy. You know, go to where your potential audience hangs out. Could be forums, social networks, whatever it is, and and and, and start. You know, working to bring people in and see if this if if this is working, mm -hmm. and and help help virality happen, right? Mm -hmm. By by giving the community both you know the incentives and the tools to easily share mm -hmm. whatever that they've joined, that they've enjoyed something, that they've bought something, sold something, whatever. And the last thing I would say, starting. But this is true, both scaling up is amaze your customers with world class personal support. This 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 pays back big time. Mm -hmm. No, that's great. You know, and I love one of the things that it made me think of what you just said. You know, we always talk about MVP, the minimal viable product, putting out something, and the way we do it now, we do it to you know to test and learn, kind of to do that cycle, right? But what you're saying is slightly different, and I think it's important, is that not only is it to test and learn early on, but the market can't actually handle the feature-rich version yet. So not only shouldn't you do it because you don't have the resources, you shouldn't do it because the market's not ready for it if the stars align and you really are the one at the right moment for that particular industry, they're not ready for the feature-rich version yet, and so you have to reduce it down to its kind of microscopic you know, proponents, uh, components, and then go forward from there. And I think that's an incredible insight that I've never really thought about. So thank totally. you for that. Totally. I think I think never try to overwhelm your you know potential audience with with too many features. Mm -hmm. They they their our ability to actually concentrate and focus online is like 
the ability of a, of a two-year-old. I mean, <laughs> That's right. <laughs> right? So they either get it from the get-go or they don't. So bet on one, the one thing that creates the most value. Yeah, that's great. Now, as you grew the supply and the demand side, did you ever have any problems where you had too much supply or too much demand? And if you did, what did you do to kind of balance that out or did it just work out on its own? Right. So, uh, so I mean, we started with, with pretty, with very limited number of categories, right? Um, and they were pretty broad, so this made made things a little bit simple in creating a good match, right? If you think about um, if you think about the marketplace, any marketplace when when a marketplace starts, there's nothing more important. There, there's actually just one thing that is important when starting, and that is liquidity, right? The ability to actually have, as you've asked, the the, the good match between supply and demand. So. We've done things to reduce the ability of, of this not happening by really going not going to 120 categories. I mean, uh, look at eBay 15 years ago. They started with knickknacks and beanie babies, and and now they have 10,000 categories. But they, it didn't happen overnight. Mm -hmm. So the same was was for us. And and then you know as we pushed you know more and more categories. We continue to be very aware of the ratio between the number of listings and, and the number of buyers, and we made sure that the balance um, was kept using um, different techniques. I mean, you know, when people look at Fiverr um, and you look at the marketplace, as as any other product that 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 uh, strives to be simple, it looks simple, right? But behind the scenes. There's a there's a huge machine that actually operates the marketplace, which is, I would think, maybe five or ten times bigger than the marketplace itself, and it employs all kinds of um, algorithms and, and systems that make sure that things from the long tail are being surfaced up, and things that are being you know not getting enough attention are getting attention and so forth. So so we were very aware of that. Mm -hmm. And as we develop the categories, we maintain this. And if certain categories, you know, don't work, then you either rename them, change them, tweak them, or just take it off. Mm -hmm. right? But you concentrate where you can actually create this value for, you know, both sides of, of the equation. Yeah. So you've talked to us about how you kind of got going with that initial group of users, um, but you guys are a massive site now, and I want to know a little bit about where your customers actually come from now. Um, what are the primary sources of new users today for Fiverr? Right. So um, I, I'm I'm very pleased to say because you know when we started this, um, I mean we had this uh, gentleman's agreement between between us two founders, and we said you know what. It's not our first startup. We've been there. We've seen this entire usual cycle of hyping and buying traffic and you know doing customer acquisition. This time, we're not going to do any of that. It will either grow organically and virally because this this is the only sustainable model, or it's not going to happen. Right? We're going to figure it out. And today, more than three years after that, it's still mostly organic. That's great. So, so, so it is great, and it it, it also you know it, it says something about about the huge size of the market, and we're barely scratching the surface. Yeah, and within organic, um, can you break it down even further? Are we saying that most of it's Google? Is that what you mean, or is most of it just Twitter referrals? I mean, where does it actually shake down? It's, How does it look? It, it's mostly direct, actually. Oh, really? So people so, know of Fiverr.com so and actually go to is, it. Yeah, there is there is uh, a very good awareness to the brand itself. Yeah. So, do you think like having a name like Fiverr and having a brand like Fiverr allows direct to be such a huge channel? It it could be. I mean, it also. I mean, the uh, the flip side of it could have been would this name be a limitation on the growth of the company? So, which was one of the things that we were concerned about. But it turns out to be a very catchy name, and and you know. At some point, you just, I mean, since services still start at $5, mm -hmm. it's fine, but, you know, 
a lot of people don't actually realize the connection between Fiverr and, and $5, <laughs> really? which is actually quite surprising. Yeah. Now that's funny. Now let me talk to you about retention a little bit. Um, do you guys have a hard time retaining users, getting them to be repeat buyers, or do you not really care if they're repeat buyers, that you're okay with people coming in, buying a single gig, and then going on their way? How do you guys view retention if there is such a thing for Fiverr? Sure. So. So sure, I mean retention, retaining users is a huge part of uh, of any marketplace success, mm -hmm. right? Um, you, you can see that when companies start measuring cohorts, right? Mm -hmm. You notice that um, the the strength of the of the build up, the build up effect, is essentially new cohorts building on top of old ones, right? Mm -hmm. So so retention, having repeat business, is is a key. Um, so, one of the things that you can do, I mean, we're doing all kinds of things around growth, hack, growth hacking, but one of the things that you can do is, in order to actually bring someone to, to be a repeat customer, you need to give them a, first, a great first experience, mm -hmm. right? So, you need to put a lot of emphasis and a lot of uh, attention to really bringing a, an amazing first experience in every in every aspect right and if you take care of that then you'll see that the lifetime value of a buyer becomes much bigger the the time that they stick with you is much longer returning business is if we look at the, uh, the pie of, of fiber mm -hmm. is the majority at the beginning of the episode you mentioned reducing friction do you think reducing friction and giving them a great user experience are really two sides of the same coin? Do you think it's easier to give a great experience when you don't have a thousand moving parts and there's less friction? For sure. <laughs> For sure. I mean, listen, you know, one of the key family values of fiber, and I'm not kidding, is things simple. Mm -hmm. And we're, we're trying to, we're actually trying to, uh, to, to practice this on everything we do, everything from our relationship with the team to the agreements that we were doing with our investors to the product. Mm -hmm. Everything needs to be simple. And achieving simplicity is probably the hardest thing that we ever done. Mm -hmm. But it's worth it. Because once you do that, once you take away frictions, everything falls in place. People get it. Because think, it's simple. Do you think a lot of startups fail because they don't think simply? Because they, they think too dip, too complicated about their product, the team, everything. Come on, I mean, you're probably like me. We're testing, I don't know, five, ten new services per day. You tell me. I mean, mm -hmm. you go into a product, you try to figure out what does it do. You have a million menus and options and everything, and you move you move on in life because it's it's just, you know, who knows what, what this is doing while. You have super, sometimes you notice something and you say, God, it's so, it's so stupid simple. I mean, mm -hmm. think, about, think about amazing ideas, um, which are not stupid at all, like Instagram. I mean, the, the idea itself, so, so simple. <laughs> yeah. but this is what makes it so amazing. The simplicity of it, the fact that it's so simple that everybody gets it. Yeah. You don't need to struggle around buying users and then buying the, their way to, to, to stick with you and everything. You don't because it's mm -hmm. so, so simple. Think about, think about Facebook, how it started. It started simple. It started like hot or not with, with photos from your, you know, people from, from your, uh, uh, you know, college or something. Mm -hmm. It was simple. And then other layers of, Features and complexities were building up, but people got the the essence. They got the, the true value of it, and then they can decide if they want to, you know, use the whole the entire hundred features of it or just one. Mm -hmm. but they get it. They're hooked already. Yeah. So I think I think most actually most startups probably fail in simplicity. Yeah, it seems like simplicity is like the greatest growth hack. Because if you can just be simple, you're going to accidentally make a thousand right decisions every week. Like you won't even know why that psychologically that works, 
or why yeah. technologically that works. But if you're simple, it does just work, and you don't even have to know why. It's just going to, <laughs> right? Right. That's right. Great. It's, I think it's 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 also it's it's also easier to fix simple things <laughs> yeah. because you don't have that many variables, right? Mm -hmm. Something simple, okay, so you take the button from the right to the left, okay, mm -hmm. fine, you make it bigger, you make it above the fold, not below the fold, you, mm -hmm. you know, play with it, whatever, but, but it's simple, right, you don't need to, to think about a hundred different things at one time, you can actually separate the issues. Yeah, and that's exactly the experience that I have with Fiverr, I go to Fiverr, and it's so simple that I don't, I don't know what features I would want it to do that it doesn't, but it doesn't do very much. It's like it's the right mix, you know. I go on there, I spend five dollars, I get an email telling me when my gig's ready. It's, you know, like you keep saying, it's simple and it works. And right now, when I think about Fiverr, I have no fear of going back. I have no, you know, insecurities about getting back into the website and figuring out how it works again. I know that if I just show up on the website in just a matter of seconds, I'm gonna be able to buy whatever I want to buy. Um, and so I think you're right. I mean. For a site as large as you guys are, I think you said it's one of the top couple hundred sites on the internet. Is that right? Or it's Alexa 200. And something. Yeah, so Alexa 200. I don't know if there's an Alexa 200 site that's as simple as Fiverr, which is also a marketplace. There might be a blog on there that's you right. know that way, but in terms of a marketplace, it's that simple. I mean, you guys have to be the simplest, right? <laughs> It could be. I mean, Craigslist, if you consider it the marketplace. Uh, well, that's another great example of simplicity kind of winning the day. Exactly. Yeah. And people struggle to analyze it. Yeah, but it's some design. Who cares? Who mm -hmm. cares? It works. Mm -hmm. People love it. It works. They under, they get it. Yeah. And you you can I mean people can can continue, you know, arguing to death about the design of Craigslist. Mm -hmm. The point is it, it it's working, right? Might, really it cool. might work better if you do some changes. Who knows? But but the point is if that's good for the company that's fine. Yeah, you know, it's funny because I'm a designer, I'm a Helvetica snob, but yet when I go to Craigslist, I see the Times New Roman, there's something that's warm and fuzzy about it. Like, I'm glad they don't care about the stuff I care about. It just right. feels right. So I think there's something there that's really deep, and I hope the people watching and listening to this really think about what's being said here. Um, let me ask you this. What are some of the primary metrics that Fiverr tracks to kind of keep a handle on its internal health? What are you guys looking at to say, okay, when this goes up, we're doing well. When this goes down, we're not. So we can kind of get into your head a little bit. All right. Well, th there's many. I mean, mm -hmm. each each uh, um, product has, it, has its own KPIs. Um, and, and, I mean, s since we're a marketplace as opposed to, to an eyeball-driven business where it's all about you know, uh, all about traffic and and, uh, and and usage. We focus mostly on business KPIs. So, you know, things like uh, the number of first-time buyers, right? Mm -hmm. um, the uh, first-time sellers, mm -hmm. the number of listings, um, the average selling price, the ASP, um, number of registrations, um, conversion rates from traffic to business, right? New versus returning both on traffic and on business. Mm -hmm. um, you've, you've, in the beginning, you've asked about the ratio between you know, buyers and sellers. That, that's a very important one. Mm -hmm. um, but, but basically, I mean, and, and again, uh, new versus returning, mm -hmm. and you know, cohorts, retentions, churns. All, it's all the pretty, typical stuff. It's pretty much all obvious all the for anyone who's... <laughs> No, that's good. Um, do you have people full time at Fiverr working on growth? Do you have a team of people somewhere, and their only job is to grow the marketplace, or how does that shake out? Yeah, we have. I mean, um, when we, at the beginning, I mean, it was it was probably most mostly us, the the entrepreneur uh, entrepreneurs, because we're, we're at core we're both product people, so um, so we, we were very you know uh, focused in doing that. But I think that. Uh, Recently, we have really reconstructed our marketing team, and I think much thanks to uh, to conversations with with growth team at other companies like uh, Facebook, for example, we've decided to split our marketing team um, into brand marketing, which does PR, community, social, mm -hmm. and growth marketing. 
ah. which is a team that is completely focused and around the entire marketing cycle. So you have anything from acquisition to activation to virality to retention to virality and resurrection mm -hmm. of, of last users. So they look at each of those flows and they tweak them to death. They A, B, test them, you know, constantly. Mm -hmm. and, and this is how we actually, we actually go about, uh, about growth. Yeah, I really like the way you talk about splitting the team into two parts. Um, because I think that's kind of the, you know, you start out with one guy that's doing growth. And then when you start building a team, you know, then you have a team around growth, but then kind of the next evolution is you have two teams. One, because there is a difference in PR, social media, you know, community, as opposed to, you know, registration flows and acquisition and retention. There is something fundamentally different about those two. So I think it's wise that when you get to the spot where you can break off the team to do that. Um, now, I, the next question I have on here, um, I'm going to ask it, even though I think I already know the answer <laughs> because we've talked about it already. If you had to summarize the main reason why Fiverr has taken off like it has, uh, what would that be? Luck. <laughs> luck. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm kidding. I mean, luck plays a, a, a huge part in, in every success, but uh, I think it's I think it's it's really a combination between um, simple, very simple, yet disruptive idea, disruptive uh, product that launched on the right time. All right, Stars so simple line. plus disruptive plus timing. That's good. That's, that's an equation right there. That's something to remember. That's okay. good. <laughs> now, before Fiverr uh, started, you actually had a number of other startups, and you mentioned that before. This wasn't your first time at the rodeo. Um, what were some of the things you started before? And you don't have to go into details, but just kind of at a really high level. What sort of things were you dabbling in? I think I think the, the one. Um, so Fiverr is my fifth venture mm -hmm. um, to date, and the one I enjoy talking. Uh, most about other than Fiverr is really my first because so many lessons learned from that. It was very naive. It was a, a software um, company. It was a security software for flash drives. An idea that I had while I was still practicing law, which was my first career. Mm -hmm. um, I had an idea on how to secure flash drives and I didn't know how to start. So I went online and this was 93, 94, so not, Google was not that big at the time, and everything was about shareware and like, you know, sites like two cows and everything. I, I, I didn't know how to code, but I, I'm very technical, so I had an idea on how to do that, and I actually found someone on a web page written in Russian, right, and I translated it using Bubblefish. Uh -huh. um, and and we got to talk, and he was barely speaking English. And it turns out that he was from uh, from the Soviet Union in a, in a small town near Siberia. Mm -hmm. And we had this idea, and we we kicked it off. And three months down the line, we had a product. It was working. We were just talking online. We formed a, co a company in Delaware, <laughs> and we found patents for it. It was very naive, uh -huh. um, and we started selling. And I think that the first sale, the, the first time that I got an email saying someone who I don't know, it's not family or friends, paid $19 for something that, that I've done. It was probably one of the biggest wins in the career. I mean, it's, it's, it's really a feeling that, that is, is, is hard to recreate. And the thing is, you know, we're starting making sales and we found ourselves selling to the U.S. government and to corporations like Merrill Lynch and Deloitte and everything, which probably thought that we were a decent sized startup, but we were just two. And, and this company really lasts and, you know, it didn't grow to become something, you know, more than a few hundred thousand dollars per year, but we didn't. You know, once we put the product there, it was not much of an investment. It was just money coming in. And we probably had, and, and that was like nine years ago, right? And we had probably 50 opportunities to meet. And we haven't met to this day, <laughs> this, this guy and myself, which is, which is amazing because it's, it's, it's really, you know, kind of the core. It's like, it's a great story from the, well, the beginning of the internet before social networks and before that was possible. Now I always get back to the story because it's 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 really, you know, 
it's a great fun. Movie. It's a fun it, story. It was fun and a lot of lessons learned from that. That's great. It just shows you what potential the internet has unlocked for all of us if we're willing to you know, take okay. advantage of it. Now, do you feel like you've taken those experiences and because of them, it allowed you to make Fiverr a success? Did you learn along the way? Was it important that you had five startups before Fiverr, I guess is what I'm getting at? Sure. I mean, I think that, um, I think that the, 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 the funny thing is I, when I think about it is that the key takeaways um, from all of my startups have become kind of our f- core family values at, at Fiverr. And we're Fiverr, so we have five. Uh, <laughs> they are, you know, work hard, stay humble, be creative, take risks, and think simple. Like those are the those. five. Those are good. And, and, and you know, and, and, and we've talked about simplicity. Probably the, the, uh, the, the last one is, is the hardest one to achieve, but, but it, it's definitely... Uh, worth it and I mean um, it's really you know and, and, and taking and going back to the first my first company the, the first lesson is probably to take a leap of faith right to, to just if, if, if it burns within you just, you need to try it you need to you need to uh, um, and, and, and you know and the rest we we'll talk about that's great. Uh, well, Micah, this has been awesome. I have two final questions for you here. Uh, the first one is, what's the best growth hack that you've ever implemented? It might be at Fiverr, it might be somewhere else, but what's something you did that just really, really worked well? <laughs> right. So um, I'm not sure if, if there is one that is the best. Um, we've done hundreds of experiments, and I think um, you know some make big change, and some are, are really small. But, but, but the thing to remember is that if you run 10 experiments, 10 A-B tests, right, mm-hmm. and they each only change 1% or half of a percent, if you change all of them, you gain 10%. Mm-hmm. And, you know, people neglect this small fact, right? They do A-B testing and say, ah, it's half a percent. Who cares? I mean, it's not conclusive. You know, let's drop it. No, don't drop it. It's half a percent. Mm-hmm. Do twenty of those. You're you're gonna get 10, 15 percent. So that's that's super important. So I, I I think that this is this is kind of the core, right? Test everything and 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 and, and don't you know uh, don't disregard the small changes. They amount to big changes. I like that. Um, the last question here: What's the best advice that you have for any startup? that's watching this and they're trying to grow. They want to be like Fiverr when they grow up. <laughs> okay. Um, so, so first of all, if, if you're a startup and you're at the stage where you look to grow, that's probably a good sign, right? Because it means that you have an initial traction and, and now you need to grow it. So I would, I would say that uh, the thing to do is really to start from understanding the uh, mechanics of your users, right? The, 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 the you know the, the the fundamental things that drives them. Why do they visit or download your app, right? Why or what makes them stay, right? Um, what makes them register, buy, use, share? You know, do extensive A/B testing um, of everything you think can make a change, right? Mm-hmm. Measure, iterate, repeat. I mean. Look at look again. We've talked about Facebook, but the same applies to to Twitter, right? They they realize that having a certain amount of friends or followers um, really increase retention and stickiness. So a lot of the growth is really internally. So understanding really the 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 the, the way your audience interacts with your product is key because you can do better. It doesn't. It doesn't matter how good you're doing. You can do probably twice or three times better if you actually understand, you know, these fundamentals. And eventually, they also tri- if you trigger, if you increase satisfaction, if you increase retention, you also increase virality inherently. Right? Eventually, it's going to happen. Yeah. That's but, that's uh, probably the the best thing. Look look really near you because. Mm-hmm. You know, a lot of those secrets are there. <laughs> That's great. That's uh, incredible advice to end on. You can do three times better. So, Micah, thank you so much for uh, coming on Growth Hacker TV. Thanks for having me.